So, now how do you raise the benchmark in parliament? <coughs> by sending in better quality. By sending in better There's no other way. There's no other way. I mean, it's pointless sitting in the coffee shops and the pubs and saying, useless good for nothing. But, you know, we, we have to take ownership of parliament. We have to say, if the political parties will not take the lead in lifting the quality, it's our institution. We have to take the lead. We have to take the lead. So it's to raise the benchmark. Now, number four, to urge political parties to make earlier disclosure of candidates. This is a problem that we have on both sides of the divide. And again, I will try to focus on this when I take you through the processes that we are proposing to do. But this is, I think, something, friends, that has to stop. It has to stop. I mean, um, both sides will, will only introduce their candidates two or three days, if you're lucky, before nomination. And how much time does that allow voters to scrutinize? And assuming you find that this candidate, both sides, are so terribly flawed that they have no business getting into these lawmaking assemblies, you have no time to source another one at that, at that, at that point in time. Eight days to, to polling. And when you start to, to, to see the net context, you begin to understand why a lot of the young people especially say, what's the point? I mean, candidate A, candidate B, and blah, 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 But people have got to stop this, this uh, what's the point, and therefore do nothing. These are our institutions. These are our constituencies. If, you, if, if political parties tell us people are the boss, then we have to start playing the role of the boss and say, this is what we want. Next, please. Okay, I'm still on this. Independent candidate initiative. Huh? Certain assumptions. You remember now with the the fraud festival that we've had this year, five of them crossing over. Opposition has 76 left. All right, and if you take the BN plus the BN friendly, it's a total of 146. I am suggesting. Remember, they wanted to get the two-third majority back. They finally failed. That's. That might suggest that the 76 that remain, Adam Marwa's era. Adam Marwa. They didn't, they didn't bite the bait. They didn't bite the bait. So in that sense, it may be safe to assume that the 76 incumbent Pakatan MPs are safe in that sense. There is integrity. But we must not assume that they are necessarily MP material. That is not an assumption that we are prepared to give. We will assume that they are honest and individuals of integrity, but not necessarily anti-material. Alright, so we don't have to worry about the, any of the 76 hopping if they are re-elected again. Yeah? The concern we have is who will be offered to challenge the 146, 140 VN and 6 BN friendly, the frogs. Who are going to be offered to challenge the BN incumbents and the independents? That's the concern. Why? Because, like always, they will disclose only at the 11th hour. So it's near impossible to do a due diligence on the individual who's being offered by the non BN parties, or in this instance, really Pakatan. The other concern is the politics of patronage that is practiced on both sides of the divide. If you are Ketua Chabang, if you are a divisional head, all things being equal, you will be nominated, nominated as Chalun, if you are a divisional head. Um, this, is, this is troubling because, you know, when, 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 when you want to fix your car, you don't send it to a washing machine repairman, you send it to a mechanic. Now, we are talking about the business of lawmaking and scrutiny of government policy. And it's given to a divisional chief not because he has the credentials, he has the qualifications, he has what it needs, what it, what it requires for him to perform as a lawmaker, but because you have served the party well. Now, what, what, what does that tell us? Our constituencies are being used 
as payback or job well done on the ground. We have been shortchanged. We have been shortchanged. Now, you imagine someone who has been faithful to the party but who struggles to run a stall. And he has a stall, let's say, in some corner in the kampong. And he has become popular. He makes about 700 a month. Because he is able to mobilize, all things being equal, the party ends up nominating him as a candidate. He gets elected into parliament. He earns 700 a month running a stall. Now BN is putting 10 million in front of him. Tough, tough to say no. Because he might start to think, God gives me 10 lifetimes so I won't see this kind of money. Alright, so w w these are, these are our, our constituencies, it's our parliament that we want to defend. No disrespect intended to him. Now that's an honest man who honestly went in thinking, I am not going to give it, and then we saw this huge pile of money. So he never going, went in intending to cheat us. But what if he, in the 146 selection, you have people getting in who really have no business being there? Because they are dishonest. Alright? Now that's, that's our concern, our first concern. The 146. Who, what is the criteria for picking them? And the fact that they will disclose to us so late. Okay? Now, the Barisan Riot Independent Candidate Initiative. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case I forgot to make the announcement, please switch off the handphone. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to welcome Munir. Munir from uh, SMM, yeah. Solidarity Market. And on the right, Andrew Yong. Right, so we're targeting 30, and I, I've got to tell you, 30 is an arbitrary figure. Why? Because we could, we could, let's say we succeed in putting in 30, let's say we actually succeed in putting in 30 good sterling individuals, but because of the process, selection process of the 146, if they put in 50 men and women who have no compunction about selling their souls, the 30 are useless. Alright, it's, it's, it's a figure that really, I don't think you can mathematically calculate what's a safe buffer. All right, but our thinking is raise the benchmark, and you notice the statements of uh, Dato Sri Anwar at the Pakatan Convention. It's encouraging. Whether this is a reaction to a lot of civil society talking about quality of candidates, that Dato Sri has now said they will be more circumspect in who they This is good. This is good, and it may be that indirectly parties are responding to. The, the, the public discourse on the matter of quality. So, one way is to, in fact, pressure the parties to either disclose their scrutiny um, criteria, their systems, all right, one. More importantly, if we can urge them to move away from the politics of poll, where they disclose the candidates only at the 11th hour. And if you hear the reasons for that, it's frightening. 2008, when we spoke to the parties about this, they said, why do you hold so close to your chest? I, I, I kid you not, the first reason given was, if you disclose early, the other side will come and buy them. <laughs> I said, but that's the, the very one we don't want. So that's, that's, that's the first reason they gave, that if you disclose, BN will come and buy. <laughs> The second one, they said, is if, if, if you disclose too early, then the grassroots support, those who are also aspiring out of frustration will either uh, sabotage or mogo or refuse to cooperate or refuse to help in the campaign. And I said, look, what you're basically saying is internal problems you are taking out on the right yard. You are still at the end of the day saying, as a result of it, we won't disclose too early. And who suffers for it? The right yard. Alright? So, 
we have set a target of 30. What we have also put in place is a stringent screening process to weed out the high risk. Now, let me first say what I mean by high risk. Very quickly, if someone has this strong pension for gambling, right, my concern is you run up a huge bill in Benteng and you, know, you then become vulnerable. If you've got heavy exposure to the financial institutions, if you've got any exposure to the alone, <laughs> any, all right, you're a risk, you're a risk that we cannot afford to take. If you lead a lifestyle that doesn't generally sit with the norms of society and you need to keep it closeted, then I've got a problem. If you're a gay and you're prepared to tell the world I'm gay, so what? I'm not offering to serve as a butler in your house where your husband and your sons are at risk. I'm offering to serve you in parliament. You judge me by my track record. Then I've got no problem. It's only if you have a particular lifestyle that you need to keep from public scrutiny that you become at risk to blackmail and what have you. All right? So those are the things that we're looking at. And what we have done is we have required the candidates, the independent candidates, to first give us a statutory declaration as to assets. Number two, a detailed profile of themselves. And to sign an agreement that these will be that they agree that these documents be deposited with our risk management agency that's working with us. Risk management agency is a, a very fanciful term for a private investigator. <laughs> okay, so they can send us back to us and build the fact. Alright? And so we subject these individuals to scrutiny, very close scrutiny. Now if the individuals say, I'm not prepared to sign the statutory declaration, off you go. If you're not prepared to give us your detailed profile, off you go. If you're not prepared to have your details scrutinized by the private investigator, off you go. All right? No point. We'd rather have just five individuals, but who have opened themselves up to that scrutiny, than to give you 30 and you know, pray and hope that they never succumb to the money. All right? Um, and finally, we are looking to draw them from the professional bodies the NGOs, and I should add one more, NGIs. Um, there are some sterling individuals in civil society who do not operate through organizations, who we hope will come forward and say, yes, I'm prepared to do a term of national service in parliament to rehabilitate our institutions. Next, please. Okay. The reform agenda. Again, I, I would urge I would urge you, if you have never looked at the People's Voice and the People's Declaration, now is the time to look at it. Now is the time to look at it. I, I think, I think um, the amount of effort that went into that as a Rakyat Manifesto, all right? um, it's a shame if you don't... And I, honestly, I think I've, I've yet to see any document that so comprehensively, in the People's Voice, it lays out, I think, in about three pages, all that we've seen in our systems and society over the years that we don't like and we want to see stop. So that's a condemnation document, if you will. The people say, we don't want this, we don't like this, this has to stop, blah, blah, blah. 